Hey, this is Kip, and in this video, we're going to use the G1000 NXI to do an ILS approach into Monterey in California in Microsoft Flight Simulator. If you don't have the G1000 NXI installed, you can get it for free for both PC and Xbox directly in the Microsoft Flight Simulator marketplace. If you want the in-game ATC to work with an IFR flight plan when using the NXI, you need to enter your route or import a flight plan file using the world map. For this flight, I entered King City as my departure and Monterey as my destination, and then I chose IFR Low Altitude Airways from the flight type in the top left, and this gives us a recommended route. I'm also going to force ATC to give us the ILS 10 right approach by choosing it from the drop down here in the top right. If you leave the approach drop down on automatic, then ATC will assign you an approach depending on the active runway, weather, and so on. It's a more realistic way and I usually leave it on automatic, but in this case, I wanna do the ILS for sure, so I'm just gonna choose it here. You can always use the in-game ATC menu once you're in the flight to request a different type of approach, no matter which one they assigned you initially. King City happens to be an untowered airport, so that means there is no clearance delivery and no ground controller available to request my IFR clearance from. So I actually tuned into Oakland Center on the ground because it was available in the ATC window, did the IFR clearance through them, and then I can switch back to the local traffic frequency for departing the untowered airport. If you choose to start directly on the runway instead of at parking, the IFR clearance will automatically be done for you, and you can review the response and the climb to and maintain altitude that was given by ATC just by opening the top ATC menu and reviewing the transcript. So you can set that initial climb altitude. So for me, it was 5,000 feet, so I set that on my autopilot as a selected altitude, and I decided to manually tune in the departure frequency and the transponder code just for practice. That's something you'll have to do if you ever get into something like VATSIM. All right, so I'm going to taxi and take off, and we're going to fast forward up until the point where ATC assigns us an approach. It's not going to be a surprise what they give us because I forced it on the world map to give us the ILS for runway 10 right. Kilo India Papa, you are two, four miles east. Maintain present heading and altitude. Expect ILS runway 10 right approach by Sierra November, Sierra transition. Clear to Sierra November, Sierra. So that's what you're going to hear when ATC assigns you an approach. They cleared us for the ILS 10 right, and they gave us the transition, which is Sierra November Sierra. We can see that's already in our flight plan. SNS is our first waypoint here, so that is correct and matches what we expected. And the last thing they said was cleared to SNS, cleared to Sierra November Sierra. SNS happened to be the waypoint we just turned to go towards, so we are heading to SNS already. But if we weren't, what we could do is hit the procedure button and then choose activate approach. Activate approach sounds more complicated than it really is. What it does is make the first waypoint in the approach our active waypoint. Now we're going to look at the instrument approach procedure chart or approach plate for this approach. We would have already familiarized ourselves with this approach before even starting our flight, but now that the approach is happening, we're going to bring it up for our reference and brief it. If you're flying in the United States, you can get the FAA publicly available charts, either through the FAA directly or I like to use skyvector.com. If you want a global set of charts, including for the United States, you could first try chartfox.org. You just need a free VATSIM account to use that site. And it's basically a search engine for publicly available charts worldwide. So you may or may not find what you're looking for. And then finally, kind of the top tier would be something like a Navigraph subscription. And as part of a Navigraph subscription, you get global Jeppesen charts for use in the simulator. For this video, I'm going to use the publicly available FAA chart. So let's start at the top area here. In the very top left, we can see the location, which is Monterey, California. And then on the right side, we can see the name of the approach. So this is the ILS or localizer approach for runway 10 right. And then the airport name Monterey Regional, and then the code for the airport. They dropped the kilo here since it's an FAA chart. So it, instead of kilo Mike Romeo Yankee, it just says Mike Romeo Yankee. This whole top area here is called the briefing strip. And we're going to look at the top left part of this to start. The first box shows us our primary navigation aid for this approach. The ILS, or Instrument Landing System, uses a radio-based navigation aid called the Localizer. And here we can see the frequency of the Localizer, which is 110.7. To the right of that, it shows our final approach course, which is 098 degrees. 
And then it shows our runway landing length available, 7,000 feet. Touchdown zone elevation is 198 feet. That's where we actually land on the runway. And then the overall or surveyed airport elevation, which is different from that, which is 257 feet. Below this area is a notes section, and here it says that DME is required for this approach. That's distance measuring equipment, which we have in the 172. And then there are some notes here about circling not being authorized in certain circumstances and what to do if the approach lighting system is not operational. Then to the right of that, we have what type of approach lighting system there is for this approach and a text description of the missed approach procedure. And we'll actually look at this later on when we fly the missed approach. Then finally, at the bottom of the briefing strip, we have all of the relevant communication radio frequencies. Next, we're going to look in the center of the approach plate. This area is called the plan view and gives us an overhead or like a map style view of the approach. The first thing we're going to do is find our transition waypoint. And for us, that's the Salinas VOR located here on the right. And this is where ATC just cleared us to and where we're currently headed. Now, if we follow the line going to the west from that point, we can see a note here that says 3600 to Z-bed. And Z-bed's over here. That's the next waypoint after Salinas. 3600 is our altitude restriction, so we need to be at 3600 feet by the time we get to Z-bed. Next, at the waypoint Z-bed, we can see what looks like a holding pattern, but this is actually a course reversal that is known as a hold in lieu of procedure turn. Basically, it's a course reversal, but we enter it like a hold. So we'll need to do the regular direct, parallel, or teardrop entry as if it was a hold. But the primary purpose is for us to get turned around so we're on our final approach course to the runway, which you can see over here. This shaded area represents the signal coming from the localizer antenna. You can see how it gets more and more narrow as we get closer to the runway, and that reflects how the localizer works. It gets more and more precise or accurate the closer we get to the runway. Once again here, we can see the localizer frequency, 110.7, and there's a little line that points to the end of the runway, which is where the localizer antenna is actually installed. Below the plan view is this area called the profile. And this is basically as if we're standing on the ground looking at our descent profile down to the runway. The little black line in the bottom right here represents the runway itself. Starting on the left side of the profile, we can see Z-bed, which is that waypoint where we start our course reversal. It says that there is a one minute holding pattern, so that's how long we know to time each leg during the reversal. And it also shows the altitudes we need to be at during the reversal. So we need to be between 6,000 and 2,600 feet. So since we're on our way to that waypoint already at 3,600 feet, by the time we finish the reversal, we'll want to be at 2,600 feet. The next waypoint after Z-bed is Mink. And we can see here that there's an altitude restriction again. It says we need to be at 1,700 feet, but not below 1,700. And then there's this little X symbol and a little lightning bolt. The X or Maltese cross refers to the final approach fix. And since this is an ILS, the lightning bolt designates it as a precision final approach fix. When we reach the final approach fix, Mink, at 1700 feet, you can see that that's where we have a gray shaded area in the back of the profile view. This represents what's called the glide slope, and that's the second component of the ILS. It's what gives us the vertical guidance down to the runway. The signal from the glide slope is broadcast on a different frequency than the localizer, but we only need to know the localizer frequency to use the ILS. Below the profile view is this area, which is our minimums. The minimums refer to how low we can go on these approaches before we have to have a visual of the runway environment to continue with our landing. If we take a look at the row for the ILS for 10 right, we have both the MSL and the AGL values for our minimums. So the first number, 398, this is an MSL. So that's our barometric altitude. It's what our altimeter shows. So our minimum altitude for this approach is 398 feet. If we get to 398 feet on our altimeter and we don't have a visual of the runway environment, such as the runway threshold or the approach lighting system, then we need to execute a missed approach procedure and abort that landing. The number after the altitude shows our minimum required visibility distance. Here, when there's a slash in front of it, this is referring to the runway visual range in hundreds of feet. So this would be 2,400 feet, which is roughly one half mile. 
If the number is preceded by a hyphen, then that's listed in miles instead of feet. So for the circling approach down here, the visibility requirement is one mile. And in case you're wondering, the numbers in the parentheses are the minimums for military use. And then finally, we have a small airport diagram section here. So we can see the runways, the lighting system information, the airport elevation, and once again, the touchdown zone elevation. All right, so now let's hop into the plane and go through each of these key areas and make sure that we're all set up for this approach. First, let's make sure that we're tuned into the localizer frequency 110.7. We look up here at our NAV1 and NAV2 radios. They're currently tuned in to 110.5 which is incorrect. So one option is for me to manually dial in the correct frequency for both the NAV1 and the NAV2 radio. I'll just start with NAV1 here. I'm using the NAV knobs to the left, the inner and outer knob, to choose the correct frequency, 110.7. Then you click this little swap button with the two arrows, and that makes the frequency active. So you can see here, the identifier is showing IMTB. That's actually not the identifier we're looking for. We actually want IMRY. The only reason it's showing IMTB right now is because we're too far from the Monterey localizer. So once we get closer, we'll need to look back and confirm that it says IMRY. Now manually tuning it in isn't the only way to do it. If you actually use the procedures menu on the NXI itself, which remember we didn't because I chose a procedure from the world map, so it was automatically programmed. But when you use the procedure menu like this in the NXI to choose it yourself, you can see here it shows the primary frequency, 110.7. And when I activate it in this case, I only have activate available because we're already in the middle of the procedure. But whenever you choose either load or activate, it'll put the localizer frequency in both NAV1 and NAV2 automatically for you. All right, now we were headed towards Selena still, SNS, that's the VOR, which is our transition waypoint for this approach. And we just got the instruction from air traffic control to descend to 3,600 feet. Now, if you remember back on the approach plate, we did see a note that said after SNS and on our way to Z bed to go down to 3,600 feet. And we can actually see that in the flight plan over here. This altitude constraint at Z bed in blue says 3,600 feet. And that's the same instruction we just got from air traffic control. After that, we'll be descending to 2,600 feet in the hold, and then down to 1,700 feet for the final approach fix, Mink. Cessna Kilo, India, Papa, you are 8 miles northwest of Monterey. Contact Monterey Tower on 118 decimal for when inbound on the approach. All right, so next the controller has passed us off to the tower, and we're not yet cleared for the approach, so we're going to contact the tower and let them know that we are uh, on our way to the initial approach fix. All right, so ATC just cleared us for the ILS approach now, and we just crossed over the initial approach fix. So when they clear us for the approach, that means that unless they tell us otherwise, we're supposed to be following the published altitude constraints for each one of the segments of this approach. Here's the plan view of this part of the approach again, and you can see that we're going to be crossing over Z-bed twice in this case. Because we're doing the course reversal, we're going to cross it once, which we just did, and now the NXI and the autopilot are automatically flying this reversal for us. And then once we finish the reversal and we're coming back inbound, we'll be flying over Z-bed a second time. And you can see we'll be in that shaded area, which represents the localizer. So we will then switch over to use the localizer and line up with the runway. And because I'm using the autopilot, there's a little caveat here with the NXI. During a course reversal, if you need to lose altitude, VNAV is ineligible to be used for that descent. So if you like using VNAV, this is one case where you can't. So instead of using VNAV, I'm just dialing in 2600 as our next altitude constraint. You can see that on the left side of the profile view here, that we need to be at 2600 when we finish the course reversal. And I'm just going to use vertical speed mode on the autopilot to get us down to 2600. All right, so here we are finishing that course reversal, and you can see I've just leveled off at 2,600 feet, which is our current constraint. Now down here you can see our next constraint at the final approach fix, which is called Mink, is going to be 1,700 feet. So I've set 1,700 as my autopilot's next selected altitude. 
And up here you can see we're about to cross over Zbed for the second time. And now watch what happens when we do. You can see down here that the HSI has now changed from GPS and showing magenta to showing localizer 1 and being green. And also our autopilot's lateral mode now reads loc instead of GPS because it's using the localizer for its lateral navigation to line us up with the runway. Up here next to the altimeter, you can see the green G and a green diamond. That represents the location of the glide slope, which is our vertical guidance. This little indicator here is called the vertical deviation indicator, and it shows whether or not our vertical guidance is above or below our current altitude. So if you think of the glide slope as a laser shooting from the runway up into the sky towards us, you can think of that as the path we need to follow to go down to the runway. So the green diamond being above us is saying that that laser beam is kind of shooting over our head right now. So to follow the laser beam, we could either increase our altitude to climb up to it or just stay at our current altitude until we kind of bump our head on it and then follow it down from there. What I'm doing here is even though the glide slope's already in range, I'm enabling VNAV mode to go down to our next constraint of 1700 feet. And I'm doing that just because mattering your approach, you might not have the glide slope in range yet, and you will need to descend closer to your final approach fix altitude before you're able to use the glide slope. Now I'm also going to enable what's called approach mode on the autopilot, and this will put a new indicator at the top here, GS in white. And so now the autopilot is ready to capture and follow the glide slope down as soon as it's centered on the vertical deviation indicator. All right, so now we're descending using VNAV towards that final approach fix. Once we get to the final approach fix, we'll be at 1700 feet. And that's where we're going to expect to capture and follow the glide slope down to the runway. All right, now a bunch of things are about to happen as we cross over our final approach fix, Mink. First, you're hearing a series of beeps, which represent the outer marker. There are three markers as part of the ILS, the outer, middle, and inner marker. And you'll see that and hear those beeps as you pass over each marker. Next, our autopilot has captured the glide slope for our descent. Because we basically bumped our head on that invisible laser beam I mentioned earlier, it's now centered. You can see the diamond is centered, and we have GS up here in green. So now the autopilot is pitching us down to follow that laser beam, the glide slope, down to the runway. Something I should have done earlier but didn't was go to this references menu here at the bottom of the PFD and set our barometric minimums to what we see in the approach plate. So the minimums are 398 feet, that's MSL, or what is shown on our barometric altimeter. So you round that up to 400, and I've gone ahead and set that here, so we'll know when our minimums are when we get down to that point. So now that the autopilot is established on the localizer and the glide slope, I'm going to change my selected autopilot altitude to my missed approach procedure altitude. So you can find this in two places. One is in the corner of the profile view. There's kind of a shorthand. So you can see it has an up arrow and says 600, a left arrow, a heading, and says 5,000. Those are altitudes. And you can also see a text description of this in the top right of the approach plate. So up there, you can see the missed approach instructions written out. It says climb to 600, then a climbing left turn to 5,000 on a heading of 030. Then you take a specific radial to go to the Salinas Vortac and hold there. Luckily, the NXI makes it really easy to follow the missed approach procedure because these more complex parts like flying on a specific radial to the hold point and then executing the hold in the correct entry and the correct direction and all of that, that can be done with the NXI and autopilot. So what I'm thinking right now as I'm coming down to the runway is First of all, I'm watching my altitude. I'm waiting until we get to our minimum of 400 feet. When I get to 400 feet, I'm going to simulate us going mist. So we're going to execute the mist approach procedure. The first part of that is to climb straight ahead to 600 feet. So we keep our current course and we climb to 600 feet. Once we're above 600 feet, we'll make a climbing left turn up to 5,000 feet eventually on a heading of 030. All right, so now that we're approaching our minimum or decision altitude of 400 feet, I'm going to disconnect my autopilot and pretend that I don't have a visual of the runway. Now, what we need to do is wait until we cross the missed approach point. So that is our next waypoint that we're headed to right now. Once we cross the missed approach point, that's when we can execute the missed approach procedure in the corner. 
So what I'm doing is increasing my throttle now because I'm about to hit the missed approach point and I've decided already that I'm gonna go missed. In a few seconds, we'll pass the missed approach point and that's when we start climbing to 600 feet and then do a climbing left turn to 5,000 feet on that heading of 030. I'm bringing up the ATC window and clicking declare missed approach and I'm gonna close it because I wanna pay attention to how I'm flying right now. So I'm passing 600 feet making that left turn over to 030. Remember the classic saying, aviate, navigate, communicate. So the first thing I'm doing is making sure I am flying the plane and going to the place I'm supposed to be going. So I'm turning to 030 and I'm starting my climb up to eventually get to 5,000. Now to help me out, I'm gonna turn the autopilot on and then I'll get back to ATC. I'm gonna sync the heading bug straight ahead and go to heading mode on my autopilot. I'm using some shortcuts to do this. And then I'm going to switch over from pitch mode to flight level change mode, just to make sure it keeps us at a safe airspeed up to that altitude of 5,000 feet. Now I bring open the ATC window and hit that I've reported the missed approach and I'm following the published missed approach procedure. Now I'm quickly going to go down to my PFD and you can see here that our CDI button needs to be pressed to get back to GPS mode because the missed approach procedure is part of our GPS flight plan. And now it's suspended us and we need to exit suspended mode by either using the procedure menus activate missed approach option or by just pressing the suspended soft key at the bottom. Now that I've activated the missed approach procedure, I'm gonna to switch to nav mode so it'll use the GPS flight plan to follow the missed approach procedure sequence as it's programmed in the NXI. So what it's doing now is going to an intercept point up here while it's continuing our climb up to 5,000 feet the intercept point is gonna put us on that specific radial to go to the Salinas Vortac and to do our hold. Now that we're about to reach our missed approach altitude of 5,000 feet, I'm gonna contact ATC again. What they said when we reported that we were going missed and that we would be following the published procedure is that we should contact them again once we reach the altitude of 5,000 feet. So I'm gonna open up the ATC menu here and report that we are finished with the procedure. We're still headed to the hold, but they did say to contact them when we reach 5,000 feet. Approach Cessna November 22 Kilo India Papa published missed approach ILS runway 10 right at 5,000 feet. Cessna Kilo India Papa, you are six miles northeast. Descend and maintain 5,000 feet. Expect ILS runway 10 right approach by Sierra November Sierra transition. Clear to Sierra November Sierra. So you can hear that ATC assigned us the same approach again, the ILS for 10 right with the Sierra November Sierra transition. You could request a different approach if you don't want to fly the same one your second time around, but I decided to just go to my procedures menu and load the ILS 10 right a second time and fly it. Except this time, I didn't pretend that we had no visual of the runway, took it all the way down and landed, and then went to parking and called it a night. I hope you found this video useful in flying an ILS approach and a missed approach procedure using the G1000 NXI. Thanks for watching, and as always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please leave them below, and I'll see you in the next video.